Uh, good morning. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, as the case may be. Um, I wanted to welcome you to the global um, 2019 launch of the Civil Society Index. Um, the index, um, um, as you, as some of you uh, correctly guessed um, in the in the quiz, um, is quite old. Um, it started in 1997, and it covers 74 countries. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you. Um, to this um, discussion, um, which is scheduled to take an hour and a half, um, which is a very short time. Churchill once apologized to a friend in a letter, Winston Churchill, and said, I'm sorry that this letter is so long, but I did not have time to write a shorter one. Um, because it takes actually longer to write something shorter and it takes more work to organize a, a global seminar like this or a global discussion like this that only takes an hour and a half. So a lot of work went into this. And I just wanted to thank some of the people behind it. Um, so first of all, our donor USAID and um, Maria Mafrasabi, who is the head of the acting head of the DG Center and Sam Turner, who is a senior advisor for helping us and our partner and co-host ICNL in gestalting, organizing, um, this meeting. Um, I also wanted to tell you that, you know, putting together these books that are before you um, is a lot of work, as you can well imagine. So first of all, I wanted to thank our local implementing partners. So behind every country index, there is a local implementing partner um, that involved in, in, it, in it were um, obviously um, FHI and particularly ECA Imershuili, whose um, work both in terms of the seminar was a was a key to, to the success, as well as Jen Stewart of ICNL, um, who um, edited uh, um, edited the, um, um, the the publications. Um, so I want I want to sincerely thank them. Um, before I introduce, and now let me introduce um, Patrick Fine, who will in turn introduce. Uh, our keynote speaker. So Patrick has been a colleague of mine since he joined uh, when, when he was still working at the Academy of Educational Development. He has over 30 years of development experience. His career started in Peace Corps um, and he lived in Africa for over 20 years. Um, he then also served as a senior vice president. He served as a um, senior foreign service um, the senior foreign service desk at USA, as a senior deputy assistant administrator in the African Bureau and the mission director of Afghanistan. Um, he has been um, FHI CEO for 10 years. And um, his areas of exp expertise are many, but include also integrated development, um, donor coordination, community development, and public private partnerships. Um, and I wanted to welcome him um, and hand him over the microphone. Patrick. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Um, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, thank you for joining this event, uh, which I'm sure is going to be a super interesting a gathering. Uh, when I look at the panelists that we have lined up, and we have Michelle Becker in here to give keynote remarks, um, this is going to be a timely conversation. I want to um, congratulate USAID or thank USAID for their support over many years, over 23 years, for this CSO Sustainability Index. It's been a good investment. And it provides a very useful tool to all of us who care about the role of an independent sector of, of civil society organizations, of non-governmental organizations as being a critical part of our societies and a critical actor to demand accountability, to step in and fill gaps, to mobilize, um, mobilize 
communities, mobilize uh, people around critical issues facing their societies. Um, we're now looking at the 2019 uh, um, CSO Sustainability Index and looking at the scores. And I find it really interesting, especially to look at how scores change over time and see the trajectory of countries. And you can see that some countries make progress, others fall back. Um, it is very, very informative for us as we think about what kind of appropriate interventions, what kind of appropriate roles can we play as partners in those countries. Um, it will be very interesting to see the 2020 index because that will be impacted by this global pandemic. And I just wanna make two points before I, I introduce Michelle about uh, 2020, the current year and the impact it's had on civil society organizations. The first point is we've seen across the world the valuable role, the indispensable role that, that CSOs and NGOs have played in responding to the crisis created by the pandemic, the public health crisis, the economic crisis, and the social crisis. Um, and it's, um, I think we can count on the importance of civil society organizations in responding to the after effects of the, of the pandemic as, as we start to, to, to go past it during 2021, the role of CSOs will be clear, it will never be more important than in dealing with these overlapping crises. And, and it has been critical this year in countries across the world as societies, communities, institutions have grappled with, uh, the, with COVID and, and the um, resulting crises, CSOs have really stood up um, and played an important role. At the same time, perhaps um, never, uh, before have CSOs faced so many challenges with sustainability, particularly financial sustainability. In the UK, there was a recent poll of CSOs and a third of CSOs predicted that they would not survive to the end of 2021 because of financial challenges. In the US, there's also a crisis in terms of financing for, for uh, non-governmental organizations. And we expect many uh, organizations to, um, to go out of business to, or to merge or consolidate uh, because of those strains. So at the same time that we see the role of CSOs uh, being super important, uh, we're also seeing the strain on them the financial strain and, and then other strains um, that come from the closing space for civil society organizations impacting them. And um, I'll, be, I'll be very, very interested to hear what, what Michelle has to say because I'm very pleased to introduce the keynote speaker, Michelle Beckery, uh, who is the Assistant Administrator for USAID's Development, Democracy and Innovation Bureau DDI. So what that means is that Michelle is responsible for the beating heart of USA, the development work, the democracy work, innovation, those things that really stand out for, um, for the development community fall under her purview at USA. And she's the perfect person for that role and the perfect person to talk today to, to give us remarks around the CSO Sustainability Index because she comes from the democracy and governance world. She has 12 years of experience at IRI, the, the International Republican Institute that works on democracy and governance issues. She's an expert in this area. And the other thing about Michelle that's notable at USA, you can tell the people who are capable, who are doers, who get things done, who are leaders by what they're tasked with within USA. 
And Michelle is one of those people who is um, at the heart of all of the major initiatives that USAID has launched during this administration. She's been a key to the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, the WGDP. Um, she has uh, led the International Basic Education Strategy. She's, uh, she's there with uh, the One Tree and Trees Initiative. So when you see what USAID cares about in terms of major initiatives and who they put in charge of that, uh, that tells you who the movers and shakers are. We're so fortunate to have Michelle here. We have limited time, so let me stop there. Michelle, and hand it over to you. Thank you for being with us. Patrick, thank you for that warm, warm welcome. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm honored by that. I actually like uh, your introduction a little bit better that, you know, maybe I did a good job, so I got more tasks. My father, who's a, a farmer in Iowa, has this phrase that says, uh, there is no rest for the wicked. So I've sometimes wondered if I've been like super wicked um, or super capable. And, and I'm going with you, Patrick, I'm going with you. Uh, and I have to say, uh, it's a mutually beneficial um, because if you all have ever known Patrick or his superstar wife, Susan Fine, uh, these guys are just true leaders, true advocates, just really true, um, true heroes in the democracy rights and governance world. And I've been really fortunate to be able to work with both of you. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I was having fun looking through the chat box and seeing we have so many participants here. I saw a lot from Africa, we've got Jordan, uh, just uh, Europe and Eurasia, just so many great um, champions of the work we're going to talk about today. And so it is my honor. Um, the one thing I will have to say is, um, and I have to give my team a hard time, we're proud, don't get me wrong, we're really proud of this report. And, and I think as uh, Michael had said at the beginning, this goes back you know, 23 plus years. Uh, and it's the Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index. That is a mouthful. Uh, and the acronym you guys give us to work with, CSOSI is not much better. CSOSI, I, st I still can't say it. So pardon me, and I say this to my rock star talent, Miriam and Samantha, but I'm going to refer to this as the report uh, throughout my remarks for my own uh, for my own sake. Um, but again, thanks everyone for having me. Uh, thanks especially, of course, to my team. I just mentioned uh, to Patrick and FHI 360, uh, and of course the International Center for Nonprofit Law. So, as Patrick said, I mean, I really wanted to be here today because this is a topic that is just so near and dear to my heart. I spent a, a good portion of my career working in the international development field in the nonprofit sector. And my focus was on democracy rights and governance. And for a portion of those years, I actually traveled globally and I would work with fostering civil society. When I started out decades ago uh, in my career, I had a, a, a fascination and a foreign policy interest in the former Soviet republics and really learning from that transition um, politically, socially, economically, uh, and, and realized early on through a lot of great mentors of mine, just how intrinsic civil society was to those democratic rights and governance efforts we were undertaking, right? And the role, at the pillar, you know, that CSOs are in all of our work. I remember I had this one vivid story. It was, um, I believe it was about 2011 in Laos, uh, had just passed rather quietly, um, an opening, uh, and it was, uh, they had passed a, a law that had allowed public associations, um, which, you know, they didn't call them civil society organizations, but they, they were to be public associations, and I got to go in and do some of the first training of some of those, perf, uh, those first uh, public associations, and I remember being in the room uh, with these, you know, small groups, right? It was the first time they had, you know, been able to come together and talk about sort of the future of what their organization could look like. And I get goosebumps to this day, right? You understood the importance of what was happening because, you know, we all in this field understand the importance, right, of civil society organizations. We can't have democracy rights and governance 
without civil society, right? We can't survive pandemics and crises without our local CSO partners. And we can't have sustainability for any of our work, be it an implementer or even the US government, if we don't have our CSO partners on the ground. And so I'm so proud of this. Um, I hope you will take the time to read the report um, and really to learn from this. So, you know, when I look at this report, this marks the 23rd year uh, that USAID has tracked the trends uh, that we see as being most important to the health of civil society. And, and we recognize, right? I think all of us in this virtual room recognize a lot has changed in two decades. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, that role, that importance of civil society is important as ever, especially to us. And I'll talk about this in a minute as, as we grapple with a world um, crippled by a pandemic. And also as a USAID agency, as a development agency who has really shifted our thinking our mantra, our focus to what our goal is. And that goal has pivoted to really seeing our partner countries as that, our partner countries. Not so much as a donor donee, but as partners on this journey uh, to self-reliance and recognizing again, the role that civil society is playing in that. So at, during this event, and even as you know, we work with all of you to prepare this report, we, re we reflect on the opportunity, one, to look at, you know, what are the concerns? What are the challenges out there? But then we also want to look at also what has been positive, right? What, especially during a really difficult year, have we seen the bright, where have we seen the bright lights of civil society at shining? Um, and I think the last thing I would say on that, what it also shows you is this is a collective endeavor, right? Um, you need civil society you need citizen advocates, right? There is a strong role for our democratic political parties to play, um, all of us. And then of course the governments, right? This isn't just one side of an equation. It's really uh, kind of a, you know, really a triangle. Although I think that triangle we used to say back in the years in political theory uh, has, has kind of extended a bit, um, but it's really recognizing of course, political parties, civil society and the government and voters and sort of this, inner working of how we all are a part of this. So let me talk a little bit um, from my perch at USAID. Um, and as Patrick mentioned, I think first of all, what I, what I want to really reinforce is the name of our bureau. Development, democracy, and innovation, right? We're not gonna hit any of our goals if we don't first and foremost look at democracy, if we're looking at human rights, if we're looking at governance. Um, and we just know, we know, I know from my work in the field, you all know from your work, citizen responsive governance is the only foundation for legitimate democratic governance. And for us as an agency, all of the work we do in, in that field, right, in democracy rights and governance, recognizes the need to bring civil society to the forefront of our work. And um, this report serves as a tool that enables us to really measure and monitor the health of civil society. And we do this in what I think are seven really key areas. So we're looking at the legal environment, uh, organizational capacity, we talked about that a bit earlier, uh, financial viability, Patrick touched on this. This is really important, especially this year. Uh, their advocacy, their service provision, um, their sectoral infrastructure, and of course their public image. And these components serve as important tools in measuring the overall democratic health of a country. And we've worked on this for decades. Uh, we're proud of our work at USAID. This work is going to continue. Um, we have a fantastic team who comes in every day and lives and breathes this. And you are partners, right? You, you keep us dedicated. You know, we, we hope to be accountable to you. We hope to have a feedback loop. We're learning from each other. And I have appreciated that. So let me talk a little bit, you know, this report's always focused on sustainability. And I really think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about 2020, right? COVID-19. Um, and I would, you all know this, but I wanna say it. COVID-19 has absolutely tested the sustainability of civil society around the world. It has tested USAID as a development agency in every country we work, in every sector we work. But what we've recognized and what we have, again, what's been um, you know, fomented to us is this, we need civil society. We need our local partners on the ground. 
uh, especially during crisis and conflict, and they will continue to be there for us. So what I wanna say is to those of you on this phone uh, who are part of CSOs around the world, we are proud of you. We are thankful for you. Um, thank you for persevering. Thank you for working doubly as hard uh, for your citizenry uh, into being our partners. And I've seen optimism. My team has seen optimism. We've heard this from you in the field. And a, a country that's always been very dear to my heart is Belarus. And you know, when I look back at this year and I look back specifically um, at the elections that happened last August, you know, I have seen a brave, a beleaguered, you know, constantly harassed civil society in Belarus. Stand up day after day, week after week, and they are resisting authoritarianism at all costs in really a country with some of the most highly restrictive uh, legal environments for CSOs, right? Crippling their access to funding uh, and allowing them virtually no space for independent advocacy. But they are there and they persevere. And I just want to acknowledge that. I want to laud that. And want to thank them for being a beacon of light and democracy uh, in the country. I also want to turn to Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think of, you know, the areas where we work that have been, you know, really ravaged by, you know, years ago Ebola and now by COVID-19. And we have been able to work with our civil society organizations who have gone above and beyond to innovate. You know, that's another part of my, my portfolio. And I've watched these CSOs um, adapt and leverage digital tech, um, technologies to communicate with their constituencies. And we've seen this specifically during pandemics, during health crises, uh, where they're able to work with us and quickly mobilize communities through rapid, uh, rapid um, uh, dissemination of information. And then I want to go to Asia. Um, I had the great privilege of living and working in Southeast Asia for several years. And I want to talk a little bit about the Philippines. And um, as some of you know, one of my real passions is women's empowerment uh, and equality. And I look at Philippines and the work that we've done through USAID with our partners, and they've really led the way of advocating for those specifically in need and in marginalized communities during COVID. And we've worked with a prominent women's uh, civil society organization who's provided information to local governments, and they're showing up. Again, they are raising the flag and saying, listen, we have isolated rural communities. We have vulnerable populations. We are so worried they're going to be at the mat last mile and they might be overlooked. And because of this civil society organization, the government can't not overlook those populations. And again, it's CSO being at the forefront of advocacy. So these are just a couple um, examples, but just things that have really, you know, had me sit back and say, wow, in the period we're at, in the struggles we're facing, CSOs have never lost hope. They've never stood back. They continue to fight. They continue to advocate and we are so thankful. So let's look forward, right? 2021 is gonna dawn soon. Uh, and I am hopeful, I'm optimistic um, of, of what we're gonna see in the future. And so let's remember, we're a community of practice on this call, right? We're doing amazing things because we recognize it's collective. We need to collaborate. We need each other's strengths. Uh, we need each other's abilities. We all look at what we each can offer and how we can combine our efforts. So let me just take a minute to recognize your hard work. Um, uh, Michael had pointed out earlier, I have to tell you, you know, watching this index be put together, this is a Herculean um, feat. We had implementing partners in each of 74 countries panels of experts in each of these countries, written work products in each of these countries. And this all had to be reviewed. It had to be edited. It had to be compiled. And it had to be the best because you guys deserve the best. So a great, great effort. And I am so proud and so thankful for the work that went into this. Special thanks again to Miriam and Sam and my team at USAID, to Patrick and his team at FHI360, to of course, Michael, ICNL, Thank you to all of our partners, all of you on the phone today, specifically those of you who have joined in from overseas, the members of our international civil society organizations. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out our true partners at USAID, our missions, 
our missions are our face of diplomacy and development on the ground. And I'm so thankful for the work they every, do every day to confront crises and create change and to continue to show that the American people care. So to all of you on this call, thank you for being our partners and know that USAID stands with you today, but also in 2021 and beyond. With that, Patrick, I'll hand the floor back over to you. Thank you for allowing me um, to speak to you today and thank you all uh, for your efforts. I, I don't think I, the floor is supposed to be handed back over to me, but I do want to make a comment, <laughs> which is it, is it is so good to have a leader like you who can speak to this topic from the heart with substance and meaning. So thank you so much. That uh, Those were fantastic comments to get us started. I think I'll turn it back over to um, to Michael um, or to Jennifer. Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you to, to um, lead us off. Jennifer of uh, ICNL. Great. Thank you so much to both uh, A.A. Beckering and, and you, Patrick, for setting the stage for the rest of this event. Um, I'm Jennifer Stewart. I'm the editor and the project manager for the index uh, at ICNL. And I'm going to spend the next um, few minutes briefly explaining the methodology of the index and then providing an overview of the results from the 2019 process. Um, as Michael mentioned, it is a challenge to do things concisely. Um, so hopefully I have taken the time that Winston Churchill spoke about uh, to, to put together a, a concise summary. Um, we have some slides to look at. If we can go on to the next slide. Um, so as many of you know, the CSO Sustainability Index, or the index as I will call it, because it is indeed a mouthful to say the full name, um, assesses the strength and overall viability of CSO sectors around the world. The index analyzes seven key components or dimensions that are critical to the sustainability of civil society sectors, um, which AA Beckering mentioned and are shown here, um, beginning with legal environment and going throughout public image. These uh, dimensions are indeed intertwined. Um, but we look at them individually as well. We can go on to the next slide. Each of these dimensions are assigned a score on a seven point scoring scale in which a one indicates the most robust level of sustainability and a seven represents the lowest level. The dimension scores are then averaged to produce an overall sustainability score for the CSO sector of a given country. The scores are organized into three basic categories representing the level of development of the civil society sector. Sustainability enhanced is the highest level of sustainability um, and includes scores from one to three, while sustainability impeded is the lowest category of sustainability and covers scores below five. Uh, in between, we have the sustainability evolving category, which covers scores from 3.1 to five. Next slide. Uh, very briefly, the country reports are developed through a collaborative process that begins with a, a local partner in each country that we work in. Um, and I do want to thank again our local partners, and I'm so happy to see so many um, names of people that I work with during the year online. One of the, the few benefits of the current COVID situation and all of us working uh, remotely is that we are able to include many of our partners today. Our local partners organize expert panels consisting of CSO practitioners and experts in their country. Those panels assess and rate the dimensions of CSO sustainability during the year. And this uh, discussion serves as the basis of the report that the local partner drafts, which is then reviewed and approved by an editorial committee based in DC. Um, if you're interested in more details about the methodology, you can find those in the appendixes at the back of each of our regional editions. Next slide. Uh, the, as other speakers have mentioned, the various editions of the 2019 index cover 74 countries. This means that there's nearly 600 individual scores and over 1,000 pages of text. Um, obviously, I'm not going to cover all of that, but I'm going to highlight some key findings. The map that you see here is taken from our CSOSI dashboard, which can be found at CSOSI.org. And it shows the stage of overall CSO sustainability for all 74 countries in 2019. As you can see, the majority of countries have scores falling in sustainability evolving, which is the middle category of sustainability. And these are shown in the various shades of yellow. There are just seven countries, all of which are in Europe, 
that fall in the highest category, uh, sustainability enhanced, which is shown in green, while there are still 13 countries in the lowest category, sustainability impeded, which are shown in orange and red, um, and include eight in Africa, three in the Middle East and North Africa, and two in Europe and Eurasia. Um, as both Patrick and A.A. Beckering have mentioned, the situation has obviously changed dramatically over the past year. Um, from that point of view, the data from 2019 that we're discussing today can really be viewed as a pre-pandemic baseline. Um, it shows the strengths and the weaknesses of the sector and CSO's potential ability to deal with the crisis that hit in 2020 and will be discussed more fully in next year's reports. Next slide. This map looks at overall CSO sustainability from another perspective um, and shows how the situation in 2019 compared to that in 2018. On this map, green indicates that overall CSO sustainability improved in 2019, red indicates that it deteriorated and yellow signifies no change. Overall CSO sustainability remained stable in 43 countries while it improved in 18 and deteriorated in 13. Um, and these trends are, are pretty similar to what we saw in last year's reports. Next slide. Another way to slice the data is to look at the trends by dimension. This chart shows the average 2019 scores for the seven dimensions across all 74 countries. As you can see, the averages don't vary terribly dramatically, um, but advocacy does continue to be the strongest dimension while financial viability is the weakest um, and continues to be the only dimension with an average score that falls in sustainability impeded. Over half of the countries, including some from every region except for Mexico, have scores in this dimension that fall in the sustainability impeded category. CSOs in these countries have limited access to funding and often rely heavily on foreign sources of support. Next slide. I also wanted to look at how the dimension scores changed between 2018 and 2019 on a regional basis. Um, on this chart, the colored bars above the center line indicate the number of countries that had improved scores in each dimension in 2019, while the bars below, indica below indicate the number of countries where scores deteriorated. Um, and as you can see, each region is indicated by a different color, with blue showing E&E, &E, green showing Sub-Saharan Africa, yellow showing Asia, red showing MENA, and orange showing Mexico. There's a few key takeaways that I want to highlight here. Um, and it, starting with the positives, there, were, there was a fair degree of improvement in three dimensions this year. Um, most notable is advocacy, where 38 countries, so more than half, recorded improvement in 2019. And this follows on 41 countries that had improvement in this dimension last year. These countries were spread pretty widely across the globe and include roughly half of the countries in each region. Um, and this really reflects the growing role that CSOs play in pushing for their constituents' interests around the world. I also wanted to point out some positive developments in organizational capacity, which is a dimension that has traditionally shown pretty little change from year to year. Um, approximately one third of the countries covered in the 2019 index reported improved organizational capacity this year. And then on a related note, sectoral infrastructure, which measures the extent of support services available to the CSO sector, including resource centers, local grant making organizations, training coalitions and intersectoral partnerships, also improved in approximately one third of the 74 countries. On the negative side of things, the legal environment governing CSOs deteriorated in 27 countries, including some from each region. While this is the continuation of an ongoing trend, what was interesting this year was the fact that much of this deterioration stemmed from growing harassment of CSOs and violations of fundamental freedoms, rather than concrete changes in the legal environments governing CSOs. Next slide. I'm going to take a quick look at some of the key findings from each region now, um, starting with E&E, &E, uh, which is where the index all began in 1997. 2019 was the 23rd consecutive year that the E&E &E index was published and it covered 24 countries. This chart, which again has data taken from our CSOSI dashboard, shows the 2019 score for overall CSO sustainability, um, with green or red arrows indicating whether uh, scores improved or deteriorated. 19. Um, there's also some very tiny bar graphs, depending on how big your screen is, that show the, the trend of CSO sustainability over time. Uh, e, e is interesting because it includes both the country with the highest level of CSO sustainability of any of the 74 covered by the various editions of the index, which is Estonia, as well as the country with the weakest level of CSO sustainability, uh, Azerbaijan. 
In 2019, we had roughly equal numbers of countries that had improved and deteriorated CSO sustainability scores, uh, with five countries reporting better scores and four reporting worse scores. We continue to see that CSO sustainability in e and &E falls largely along sub-regional lines, with the northern tier countries, which includes the Baltic and Visegrad countries, generally having the highest levels of sustainability, and those in Eurasia generally having the lowest, with the countries in the southern tier falling in between. There are, of course, some exceptions. Uh, most notably, over the past several years, Hungary has fallen considerably in the rankings and is now behind most southern tier countries, as well as several countries from Eurasia, while sustainability in Ukraine is stronger than that of any of the southern European or southern tier countries. Next slide. Sub-Saharan Africa is the largest region covered by the index, uh, with the 2019 edition covering 32 countries, including Cameroon, for the first time. CSO sustainability in Sub-Saharan Africa remained constrained in 2019. Eight countries in the region continue to have overall CSO sustainability scores uh, within the sustainability impeded category, while the rest all fall in sustainability evolving. While sustainability remains limited, there was some progress made in 2019, with nine countries recording improvements and only four noting deteriorations, most often because of worsening legal environments. Of particular interest is the fact that dramatic political developments in Ethiopia and Su Sudan resulted in significant improvements in almost all dimensions of CSO sustainability in both of these countries in 2019. In Ethiopia, the prime minister who came to power in 2018 introduced several reforms that provided profound relief for CSOs, including replacing uh, the draconian charities and societies proclamation with a new law that opens up space for civil society. Meanwhile, in Sudan, CSOs played a leadership role in the revolution that led to the end of the 30-year rule of President Omar al-Bashir and made substantial contributions to the profound positive changes underway in the country since then. While overall CSO sustainability remains limited in both countries, these developments really fuel optimism for the future. Next slide. Uh, next, we'll move on to the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the 2019 edition covered eight countries, um, including Tunisia for the first time. As you can see, Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq all recorded improvements in their overall CSO sustainability scores in 2019, while Libya recorded a deterioration. The most notable trends in the Middle East really reflect the global trends that I mentioned earlier. First, the legal environments governing CSOs continue to deteriorate with more than half of these countries reporting increasing problems with registration and government harassment, in addition to restrictions on freedom of assembly. On the positive side, organizational capacity improved in half of the countries, driven by advances in constituency building, and the infrastructure supporting the sector also improved in half of the countries, with CSOs having more access to various support services and increasingly developing coalitions and intersectoral partnerships. Next slide. The last regional publication uh, covers nine countries in Asia, including Timor-Leste for the first time. As you can see, the scores for all nine of these countries fall within sustainability evolving, ranging from Timor-Leste and the Philippines at 3.5 to Thailand at 5.0. In 2019, CSO sustainability deteriorated in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, and improved in just Indonesia. The biggest story in Asia in 2019 was really the continued shrinking of civic space. The legal environment governing CSOs deteriorated in six of these nine countries. Um, and in five of them, the declines were the continuation of negative trends that started in previous years. So the Philippines, for example, has noted a worsening legal environment for the sector every year since 2014 when the first index for Asia was published. Um, and in all six of these countries, civic space was constrained through the more restrictive implementation of existing laws, as well as increasing state harassment of CSOs. In addition to contributing to the deterioration in the legal environment, negative government attitudes toward the CSO sector had an adverse impact on the sector's public image in half of the countries covered in the Asia Index in 2019. And next slide. Um, last but not least, we have Mexico. It is the only country uh, so far in the Americas that is covered by the index, and it was included for the second time in 2019. 2019 was unfortunately a difficult year for CSOs of Mexico. The first year of the incoming federal administration brought about a new paradigm in government CSO relations in which CSOs are no longer considered partners in development. Of particular note, sharp cuts to the federal budget allocated to CSOs 
um, really had a negative impact on the sector's financial viability um, and also affected its service provision capabilities. In addition, CSO's ability to influence public opinion and policy shrunk due to a reduction of opportunities to participate in decision-making processes, while the executive's negative rhetoric tarnished the sector's public image. Next slide. Um, so I have, of course, only been able to scratch the surface. Um, for any of you who might be interested in delving deeper into the data, I encourage you to visit the CSOSI dashboard, which is an interactive site that includes historical data and reports for the index and really allows you to manipulate and play around the date with the data um, in various ways. And it can be found at CSOSI.org. Um, and with that, I want to pass uh, the screen over to Lisa Peterson, who's going to be moderating our panel discussion. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Lisa Peterson with FHI 360. Um, the data that Jennifer just presented, as she pointed out, um, demonstrate a continuation of trends affecting CSO sustainability worldwide through 2019. But of course, as all speakers pointed out, the world has changed dramatically since 2019 with the global spread of COVID. And the pandemic has forced CSOs to navigate new realities. Now we will move into a panel discussion about COVID-19 and civic space as, few as, as well as a few other cross-cutting themes. The role of CSOs in social movements confronting crisis social media for advocacy and constituency building, and new forms of CSO fundraising. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our panelists for today. Uh, and please do turn on your cameras as I introduce you. First, I would like to introduce Monet Bengarga. Monet is the innovation lead for Civicus and currently heads a multi-stakeholder partnership that supports the Innovation for Change Network, a community-led initiative to defend and strengthen civic space. She's working to develop new methods to increase both citizens and civil society's participation in civic space. Monet has designed over 30 campaigns to strengthen citizens' engagement in the Middle East and North Africa, and she's testing new models of partnership among CSOs, technologists, and social entrepreneurs in Africa. She has a master's degree in public policy from George Mason University and has written extensively on centering intersectional feminist leadership and innovations in civil society. Welcome, Monet. Next, I would like to introduce Orisia Lutsevich. Arisia is the manager of the Ukraine Forum in the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House. Her research focuses on social change and the role of civil society in democratic transitions in the post-Soviet region. Most recently, Arisia has conducted research on building resilience in Ukraine and safeguarding society from Russian aggression. In 2017, Arisia coordinated and co-authored a major Chatham House report entitled The Struggle for Ukraine. She has authored several other Chatham House publications, including Agents of the Russian World, Proxy Groups in the Contested Neighborhood, which was published in 2016. And she also served as a senior regional expert for CSOSI from 2014 to 2018. Arisia has provided consulting services to a number of donors and implementing organizations, including USAID, the PAC Foundation, and the Open Society Foundations. She's contributed to stories published by BBC, CNN, Financial Times, The New York Times, and Open Democracy. She holds a master's degree in international relations from Lviv State University and a master's in public administration from the University of Missouri at Columbia. Welcome, Arisia. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Joseph Sani, Sani is the vice president of the newly established Africa Center at the US Institute of Peace. Prior to taking this post, Sani worked with us at FHI 360, providing technical leadership to support the design and implementation of many of FHI's programs focused on peace building and civil society strengthening. He also served as senior advisor to the CSOSI team while at FHI. 
and we miss him a great deal. Prior to working at FHI, Sani advised a number of international organizations and development agencies, including the UN, USAID, and the Economic Community of Central African States. He led peacebuilding and civil society focused assessment and evaluation teams in more than 20 African countries. Sani has published several scholarly pieces on peacebuilding, peacekeeping, and civil society, including the book Reintegration of Ex-Combatants, A Balancing Act. He holds, he holds a PhD in public policy and an MS in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University. Welcome, Sani. And finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Charles Kojo Van Dyke. Charles currently heads the Capacity Development Unit at the West Africa Civil Society Institute, or WACSI, based in Accra, Ghana. As a social justice activist and international development professional, Charles's expertise is primarily in the areas of civil society strengthening and resilience, civic leadership, and human rights. Charles also is a member of the Global Governance Board of the Innovation for Change Network, I4C, a global network to protect citizens' freedoms. Finally, he's chair of the governing board of Africans Rising, a Pan-African movement to promote justice, peace, and dignity. Welcome to all of you. And now I would like to ask a few questions of the panelists. Those of you attending this event virtually may type uh, your own questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to address at least a few of those uh, following the initial panel questions. And panelists, to make sure that this is possible, just a gentle reminder to limit your responses to three minutes, please. I will start with a question related to the cross-cutting theme of social movements. And this question goes to Arisia. Arisia, some pundits believe that the fabric of civil society is changing and that social movements, grassroots organizations and civic actors, especially those in Eastern Europe and Eurasia, are transforming the way that we conceptualize civil society. What do you see as the key factors contributing to this change? And how, if at all, do informal groups such as social movements engage and collaborate with more traditional CSOs to affect change? What are some examples that you have seen in the Europe and Eurasia region? Thank you very much, Lisa. Good day to you around the globe. Uh, it's a great pleasure to belong to this community of the Civil Society Sustainability Index. Uh, and I think uh, congratulations on the release of, of, the, of the new uh, report. Uh, Lisa, I think it's not just the fabric of civil society is changing, it's our societies are changing. I mean, we live in the world of complexity, the world of high speed, the world of unpredictability. And uh, of course, the COVID pandemic just uh, exaggerated this feeling uh, uh, where it doesn't seem like some kind of academic or news rhetoric. It touched intimately all of us, our families, and, and I hope that uh, participants of our event are holding well in terms of health and surviving this pandemic. But there are a couple of factors that are linked to this rapid change that I talked about, especially in the region where I come from, some of the triggers for quite strong social movements where, as I call them, three Cs, of course, COVID, number one, then it's conflict, where you have still a lot of societies that are facing frozen conflict and in some like in Ukraine still heated conflict and political crisis. I mean, we look at Belarus, Michelle uh, um, spoke about it, look at Georgia and you, you see citizen mobilization to protect rights, to protect dignity. And, and I think the, these uh, triggers are linked to an immediacy of an urgency. Uh, the second factor is, of course, technological mobilization that enables all of this, enables to participate around single issues. You don't have to commit uh, to make too much of an, um, you know, a choice of an organization. You can just go out on the street, you can just donate to a crowdsourcing uh, resource, and you will feel like you are part of something bigger. 
the second trend, uh, the third uh, factor is changing values overall. There's been a release of the new worldwide values uh, wave uh, just a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago. And we do see, especially in our region, Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Eurasia, the growing uh, values of self-expression versus collective values. And this uh, kind of means that people that are coming from, let's not forget totalitarian systems, they have a certain aversion to formal membership, like it was in the Communist Party or in the Komsomol. So they tend to participate in more fluid way. So some of these examples, in addition to Belarus that we've already seen was an impressive uh, engagement around helping uh, vulnerable groups around COVID uh, was to deliver together with the private sector citizens and NGOs actually to um, uh, give PAP kits and all kinds of uh, healthcare uh, materials that were needed for the hospitals. What, uh, what an amazing uh, social movement in Poland uh, that has a hashtag this is war against the recent abortion regulation of the constitutional court that makes it uh, you know, one of the most strictest regulations in Europe. And we see the solidarity across all social groups of women and men to stand uh, for, for these rights. Uh, and of course, if, if you ask me, because I think I should be wrapping up about what is the interaction of these social movements that we see and formal civil society. I think it's, um, it's um, there's still a gap that could be bridged better, I think. I think is social movements, as I said, they are the signs of uh, emer uh, emancipation of societies. It means more and more people want to have a say. But it also means that uh, a lot of these um, uh, explosions of activism are short term. They are like sprint, whereas a formal civil society is more of a marathon. And this is what we need. We need more uh, engagement of active citizens with more sustainable groups like formal civil society to deliver very complicated um, social change and behavioral change that is not going to happen over one or two protests. But I think for those uh, who are right now with us on this roundtable, especially civil society leaders, I think it's an interesting opening uh, to, to capture and to think about how you can uh, build more active citizenship because uh, you know, there's that famous phrase by Karl, Karl Popper who said, democracy can help preserve freedom, but it cannot create it if individual citizens don't care for it. We see more individual citizens caring for it. And now it's time for formal groups and civil society to step up to this opportunity. Thank you so much, Arisia. I would just like to ask one follow-up um, related to the trends and the, the fluidity of these movements that you pointed out. How do you see the role of donors adjusting to support the non-traditional groups and movements that you described? I think it, it's, uh, it's an important, um, if, 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 if I would see it as a part of the ecosystem of civil society, not something that is separate, a different animal. It's just a different kind of participation that requires certain flexibility. And we do see, for example, in Georgia, USAID providing funding to informal groups. And, and I think learning from experiences where other implementing partners have and bringing it to, to, to other region, of course, to ensure accountability is important. Uh, so I would say the funders should keep their eyes open, not just to those organized groups, but also to these new formations. Uh, they should also, I think, in, in, in the region where I come from, of course, where this very strong Russian uh, objective to undermine reforms and to undermine development of open and civil societies is to look at resilience and how it can play in into the um, equation because uh, resilient societies are built by resilient citizens. Uh, and we need to expand that base. So if funders would bring in that framework into work with their civil society partners to co-govern, to co-create and to have co-ownership of these projects uh, that would invite uh, formal and active citizens, teachers, religious leaders. So I think it's time to expand the table where communities are, are coming together, 
of course, it's not easy because not everybody wants to be at the table. People are busy. There will be more economic pressures. But I think it's possible because communities will understand at crisis like COVID with natural disasters, they have to build self-reliance and civil society is a key piece to that self-reliance. So there's a new uh, hook if you want. Thank you very much, Arisia. And now I'd like to move on to uh, a theme mentioned previously, which is COVID-19 and civic space. And I'd like to ask the next question of Charles. Charles, we've seen authoritarian actors using the COVID-19 pandemic to create new impediments to civil society globally. At times, diminishing freedoms of association, of assembly, and of expression in the name of public health. How is civil society effectively responding to democratic backsliding, particularly in the face of COVID? And how can donors help CSOs to be more resilient in these circumstances? All right, thank you so much, Lisa. That's a very important question. Um, so when it comes to issues around uh, attacks on our civic freedoms, uh, attacks on civil society, this was something that was increasing exponentially way before um, COVID came. Uh, so when the pandemic came, it, what it has done now is to accelerate uh, the shrinking of civic space for civil society. So right now, what we see is there's a long-term erosion of civic space and, and freedom of expression. And so what we're seeing is, and you're right, there's democratic backsliding, there are governance reversals, et cetera, going on, uh, specifically if I speak for the continent of of, of Africa. But in the midst of all these difficulties, what we are seeing are resilient citizens who are still trying to hold governments accountable, who are still protesting in the face of impunity uh, and police you know, brutality. In the midst of uh, um, unprecedented censorship, we have citizens that are also uh, finding alternative ways, uh, for ways to communicate. But specifically in terms of responding, what I've noticed that I've seen that there's been four responses that should, I think, encourage all of us. I think there's been an increased awareness raising on, on the rate of civic restrictions by government and other non-state actors. So what we've seen is that tools like the Civicus Monitor are being used for advocacy. Uh, information from this monitor are being used by organizations to raise alarm bells about the increase in restrictions. So for example, the top three violations uh, this year has been the detention of journalists, has been protest disruption and then unprecedented censorship, right? So the, this tool, the Civicus Monitor, which I think is a, it's a great tool uh, and the work that is being done by ICNL, by WAXI and all other actors who work on civic space is helping um, actors to really raise awareness. The second thing I'm seeing, which is quite exciting is that there's been an increase in what I call transnational advocacy. So what we used to see, uh, before the pandemic was, there was an emphasis a lot on national issues. So if something was happening in Nigeria, you know, you won't get a response from organizations in Ghana or organizations in Cote d'Ivoire. But what we are seeing is that there's, there's because of the pandemic, which, is, which has been a great leveler, what we are seeing is that citizens are now becoming aware that these national issues have regional and continental ramifications. And so organizations are coming together beyond borders to address these issues, issuing statements, working together. And we saw that with the protest in Guinea against the third term, um, um, the protest in Cote d'Ivoire, and recently the protest against police brutality uh, in Nigeria. So I think this is really exciting. The third thing that which I think it's civil society is doing now, it's, it's realized that it can't do this alone. And so civil society is now being a bit more strategic, building partnerships, in other sectors. So what we've seen is that civil society is reaching out to intergovernmental agencies. They are reaching out into the government space. They are reaching out to the private sector and looking for allies in these spaces to build alliances because they recognize that they need people with, with like-minded aspirations in these spaces to get sure, to make sure that the policies and the laws and, 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 and certain administrative procedures change so that we have more, op more of an open society. The fourth thing, which, is, which even excites me even more, is the, is the fact that we are engaging the media and academia much more differently. Uh, previously, we used to just invite the media 
to cover events. Now we are strategically bringing the media into our space you know, to think through advocacy as efforts. So they become a part of the process. We're using academia more deliberately and intentionally, you know, really leveraging on their expertise in terms of gathering data, especially for evidence building. And so when it comes to issues of donor support, I believe what donors should be doing is to strengthen the ecosystem, civil society ecosystem, so that uh, there's more international collaboration and support to raise alarm bells around this area. There needs to be a more cohesive uh, information flow and what I call early warning and early response when it comes to issues of raising alarm about civic space infraction. I think that donors can work with various organizations to set up much more, a much more of a global mechanism. Right? And I also feel that uh, what the second thing donors can help organizations do is to get communities involved in, in reporting violations of human rights. So maybe a community early warning system, because what we've seen is that there are a lot of organizations that work on these things at the grassroots. But of course, we have a lot more, this is just a microcosm of the society. We have a lot more citizens that can be of help. And if citizens have the, have the technical know-how, the expertise to actually uh, participate in early warning about, um, about civic space infractions, that would be extremely helpful. And then the third thing I think is resources, 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 not just financial resources, but skills, materials, et cetera, and more flexible funding. Um, you know, I think reducing the activity-based funding, but allowing more flexible long-term funding in this area. And then a multi-sectoral approach. Let us work with the private sector and other key stakeholders. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Charles. And now I'd like to switch over to Sani for, uh, for another COVID related question. Sani, during any humanitarian crisis and COVID is no exception, we often see CSOs on the front lines. Patrick talked quite a bit about this, providing essential services to the most vulnerable groups. Do you see the demand for CSOs increasing as the need for services increases? And does this better position civil society actors to influence policies and advocate for change? So thank you, Lisa, and thank you to all my co-panelists and uh, thank you to the, to the participants uh, who have made the time to come here today and to listen to this conversation and participate actually. So as my previous co-panelists said, I think this is, they have answered a lot of uh, many parts of your questions. Uh, I will come back uh, to say, I remember when I was at FHI, Michael used to say, no good deed goes unpunished. Yes. <laughs> I think there is, there, is, there is an increased demand for the services. I, and I think the question is, uh, the question about civil society relevance is not, important, they are relevant, there will be increased demand. And this crisis has shown us how assertive, how creative, how resourceful uh, uh, is civil society and particularly the civil society in the global south. I think the biggest question is, can civil society use that relevance to, in, to advocate and influence policy, uh, policies? Of course they will advocate but can they actually come up, like affect change? Uh, I, will, I will raise a couple of issues. I think one that is sometimes understudied. It is a public image, right? The, the, the capacity of civil society to shape the narrative around their work and around themselves, how they position themselves, because from that narrative depend their credibility and their ability to influence change. This is, I think, an understood area. We have been in this place before with, COVID, uh, with Ebola, for example, in West Africa. Of course, COVID is global, it's more global, but we have been here before and I, I don't want to, to rain on the parade. Uh, we have heard this before. Civil society now, this is a moment to redefine the relationships. It's a moment to affect change in, the many, in a meaningful way. But I think when it comes to shaping the narrative, we still have a long way to go. 
uh, are, there are three main things, factors. Civil society image and the capacity to actually shape the narrative and affect change is undermined by, I would consider three factors that we will have to address if we want, if you really want to capitalize on this moment. First, if you consider enclosing civic space, you have many governments are trying as hard as possible to discredit civil society organization, right? Sometimes by taxing them by as agents, foreign agents, corrupt, et cetera. So that's number one. You, we, if we want civil society to affect the change and to use their relevance to affect change, we will have to address that uh, reputational problem. Number two, government cooptation. Uh, it's different from partnership with the government, just like Charles mentioned. In some cases, the, the closing or the partnership in, with some government, the intention is to undermine the credit that civil society may take from their actions. And we really have to be careful. I'm not saying we should not uh, promote and encourage partnership, but we have to be careful how that is done. So government cooptation can be a way to undermine civil society reputation in some cases. We have seen it in some countries. Number three, surprisingly, we have to be careful with what I call the drowning of civil society reputation by, by our international partners. Uh, surprisingly, I think in many cases, and that's something we can fix, we as international partners don't actually help civil society project their image, save their reputation, and engage with their constituency. We learned it the hard way here in the US after 9-11, for example, we, we decided to think how US is, for example, communicate. So it resulted to changing our logo, putting with the American people and all these things. But we are not doing that enough with our local partners. So sometimes people know more about international organization than the local civil society organization doing the work. And so if you go in a remote village in Africa, you will see all these logos from different international organizations. You will see less of it from their local partners. And so by doing that, and then this is not nefarious at all, but by doing that, we deprive local civil society the opportunity to beef up their reputation and to become the credible change agent they are, right? So we have to reconsider how our local partners in the global South use strategic communication to position themselves as credible partners to leverage the hard earned relevance of this moment to actually affect change. So there are ways to do that. I mean, we can engage them more in the way we communicate, we in the global north. I will challenge you when you look at those, you read fancy reports from international partners, they don't mention local partners by their name. They will say, we work with local partners in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, but ooh, they don't put their name. So that's a missed opportunity to actually position local civil society and beef up their credibility, right? Uh, and also, there is a lot of technical support we can provide to the Global South, uh, work with them. I don't use capacity strengthening. I'm talking technical support, technical accompaniment to beef up, to use strategic communication to become credible partners and engage in that space, that policy making space. I will stop here for the moment and then we can uh, discuss later on how donors can do that, but I will stop. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to turn now to a new theme, social media for advocacy and constituency building and address uh, my next question to Monet. Um, I'd also like to remind our participants online to uh, feel free to submit questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, Monet, COVID-19 has further complicated the already complex task of advocacy and lobbying for CSOs and civic actors. Influencing policies virtually was the only option for many during the past year. 
to what extent have CSOs leveraged digital technology to use it for advocacy? And what new avenues of engagement with decision makers are we seeing now? Thank you so much, uh, Lisa and everyone. I'm so glad to be in this panel. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, we cannot de um, disassociate social media and what's happening in the virtual space from what's happening on the physical space. Um, so, you know, the extent of the restrictions is also getting to the, uh, to the virtual spaces. Um, and if we, you know, and I, I think Joseph made a really good point as well as Charles, like what is the optics? The optics shows or optically civil society are doing good virtually, that are engaging, that are trying to leverage the technology that is in their hands. Uh, but there is a big difference between visibility and between real change and between a real um, you know, influence of, of the advocacy level. And here it depends one, uh, which type of CSOs are we talking about? While I think movements, um, youth organizations, informal uh, CSOs are better in mobilizing people online, they are better to find innovative ways of engagement of citizens, of the people who are using the virtual spaces and social media, we see that the NGOs or traditional established NGOs are better in engaging decision makers and policy, um, and policy makers, either parliamentary or um, governments. And this is, you know, due to the difference in the type of models and tools that are being used. That being said, with the type of CSOs, we are also, um, it depends what, in, in which space are you operating already. So if you are operating in a closed civic space, um, such as Egypt, uh, the Gulf countries, um, you will not have a lot of uh, leverage, even if you have the power of the online space. And you see that there is a big censorship that Charles highlighted, and uh, we recently uh, published it in Civicus Under People Under Attack report that highlights how digital spaces are being, um, you know, censored and people um, that are already in the closing spaces now, they cannot even use the online space um, to do that. Um, the, other, the other side is also what type of advocacy are you doing? So if you are in the humanitarian side, talking about food distribution, talking about, you know, medical equipments, um, and you supporting or you have a service delivery type of approach, uh, you are welcomed um, and you can, you know, uh, your, 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 uh, your influence online and even offline is bigger. But we are talking about the human rights defenders about the prisoners. We saw a lot of campaigns online um, about releasing prisoners in many countries during COVID-19 because uh, um, of the situation. And I mean like human rights defenders that are in prisons. Um, and, 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 and this, you know, these, these type of, you know, advocacy uh, subject were not welcomed or if we talk about transparency and accountability. Um, so it was limited, the engagement or how civil society leveraged the civil space. They were really good in mobilizing and I think uh, raising awareness of the situations, of the lack of transparency, criticizing the government responses. Um, and also many of the online advocacy was trans translated in the protest in the streets. Uh, in Tunisia, one examples, uh, we saw it in Nigeria. Um, so there is a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, there, there, is, there is a results on the ground, but to which extent that influence policymakers um, and the change is where we need really to, to pay more attention um, to see how effective it is. And maybe the, the, it's not like I'm providing an answer, but from our perspective or um, in innovation for change, it looks like the best way to do is to create a multi-sectorial uh, partnership. And I think Charles highlighted this. Um, when you are in a closed space or even you are in open space, but you have a limited advocacy, you need to work with the private sector, social entrepreneurs. From our side, I think technologists should be brought to our space more often to talk and be a real partners because they are the one who are developing these social media. And you see now the big debate on Facebook, on Google, on Twitter, um, about the disinformation, how it's impacting civic space and the human rights. Um, and uh, because all these issues impact the level level of the advocacy that civil society um, is, um, is trying to, to work on. 
we see you know different you know avenues of how we support and talk with decision makers most now of the parliamentary for example in tunisia and ghana have facebooks um, have a twitter accounts citizen can tweet and talk to their own representative directly um, civil society as well can raise the questions so we see a lot of engagement, also new platforms uh, that being built um, to monitor uh, the parliamentary functions and budgets. Uh, um, I don't want to, you know, forget the local uh, governments, uh, which is municipalities and, you know, it's a different, you know, agent. So there is like more um, dynamic in engagement, but again, how that is translated to real change is where we really need to, 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 to focus, and I don't want to say only to study, but I think our advocacy has to go more through an evidence-based approach. Um, and and we've been, you know, on the on the activism side, we've been struggling to use a lot of that um, because what you want to do is you want to do the change, so you just go to the ground and do it your way. Um, however, you know, what is your evidence? What are you presenting? To make that change is the most important. Um, and yeah. That's, yeah. sorry, Monet, I, I, I'm going to turn to Arisia for for a follow up. Um, building on what you've said, thank you so much. Um, building on what uh, Monet has been describing, Arisia, in terms of CSOs leveraging digital technology, how do you see uh, that CSOs have been influential? with current and future constituents online while simultaneously countering smear campaigns, disinformation, propaganda, and radicalizing narratives in the e, &E region, the Europe and Eurasia region, in your opinion. Well, Lisa, social media space, it's a bit like wild, wild west. You know, there's also a lot of competition. There's a lot of toxic material. There's a lot of, uh, in a way, fight going on for the minds and hearts of the constituents. So it's not like civil society have, uh, you know, an open door to, uh, to communication. It's a very competitive space. And I think overall, it's, it actually is one of the critical questions for the future health of democracy and civil society how uh, this space will be in the future regulated, what responsibility the tax giants will have for um, facilitating and managing platforms of such magnitude and the power that they've, uh, they've increased. Um, so I think that what we have seen uh, among civil society actors, of course, they are becoming more proficient. They are becoming more skilled. There has been a lot of uh, in, uh, investment in capacity building, including by USAID implementing partners into uh, tapping uh, of the potential of this direct communication with citizens. Um, and we've seen some interesting uh, examples of countering COVID disinformation, for example, again, in Ukraine and in Georgia, because there was a lot of Russian content that was, you know, malicious disinformation to create panic, to spread lies about the virus. And we have seen groups who previously, you know, developed some muscles in countering, for example, Russian disinformation about the war in Donbass, about the MH17, um, taking now a new challenge with COVID. And I think this is great. It means the capacity uh, is, is increasing. Uh, another interesting use of technology is for crowdsourced intelligence, because citizens are often on the ground, they see what is happening. And the network of Bellingcat, for example, was, was instrumental in actually providing evidence on uh, some of the biggest war crimes we have seen uh, in the region, especially uh, around the Donbass area. So um, monitoring the disinformation, although of course then the, the next step is to provide correct information because debunking news, it's very often not the most effective um, no, not the most effective investment of resources. So I, looking into the future, I think civil society should uh, you know, focus on such areas as vaccinations. And this will be another big area of disinformation. What it means, you know, and what are the implications of that? They should look at providing facts about COVID pandemic because it will be evolving. You know, it's, it's not a, a, set, a, set, a set field in any way, is to actually reach out to the vulnerable groups who perhaps, you know, need a special 
training, even in using technology to access services, if we will be moving more into the digital space. And finally, an interesting example in Ukraine, it was implemented by IREX on media literacy, the project about vaccinating the minds of the people exactly to be able to have a critical thinking to um, uh, distinguish the information. And, and I think uh, they've done an amazing job in high schools in integrating curricula, not as a separate subject, but into literature and history and some of the media studies that uh, high school students do um, in order to uh, prepare citizens to deal with the flood of the information, which we see across United States, across you know Ukraine and, and the region. And I think this is thinking forward, how do you protect democracy and how do you enable citizens to have critical thinking is very important. Thank you, Arisia. I'd like to turn to uh, some questions from the audience now, since uh, we're at 10.23, seven minutes left. Um, the next question is for Charles um, from the audience. Charles, trade unions are part of civil society, but are not always included in the umbrella with other CSOs. Do you see changes for these relationships between labor organizations and CSOs during these parallel pandemics? COVID-19 health crisis, global economic crisis, and democratic erosion. Charles? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, very interesting question. Um, so the trade unions, interestingly, have a particularly special history in Africa because um, they were at the forefront of our independence struggle. So actually they are the traditional civil society if we're talking about citizens movement. Um, the, the challenge has been that over the years, uh, since civil society became a bit NGOized or professional in the way it's structured right now, the trade unions became kind of outside of that grouping um, and, and also the professional associations. Uh, I think there's just a, and uh, for me, the pandemic has provided a great opportunity for, for, for the formal civil society to engage with trade unions. But one of the things that uh, civil society, the formal civil society have to really learn is to really understand how trade unions function and the motivations of unions. Uh, and I think if we understand how unions function and their motivations and then invite them more strategically into our spaces, uh, we will start to build a relation, a more strategic relationship uh, with, with the unions. Uh, some organizations have actually tried to work with different types of unions and they've done that quite uh, successfully. So I think it's a matter of engagement, it's a matter of strategy, it's a matter of mutual you know, partnerships uh, and it needs to be done in a more deliberate, deliberate manner. Uh, and I think uh, if we do that, we'll get the results we're looking for. Thank you so much, Charles. And uh, I think we have time for one more audience question and I would like to address this to Dr. Sani. Sani, what does the Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index research show of the resilience and adaptability of CSOs given the trends identified? What kind of solutions have they adopted to ensure future sustainability? Wow, that's a tough one. I think, <laughs> so we have already mentioned issues of funding, right? Uh, so that's important. Uh, we have to come up with new ways, innovative ways to fund uh, civil society. And then we have seen trends in like social uh, um, crowdsourcing or uh, other social enterprise, particularly in countries like Ghana, Nigeria, and probably in Eastern Europe as well. But I also think that the way the, in, the international funding is structured, frankly, I think COVID has shown us one thing. We have to be humble and trust our local partners. Because we could not travel, all the work was done by local partners. So COVID has actually demonstrated local leadership and local creativity, meaning that in fact, COVID has anticipated this journey to self-reliance. So we have to acknowledge that reality. 
we have to redefine how we work our local partner and how we structure grant mechanism to local partners. I think that's also important to mention that I remember one of my colleagues was telling me, Sani, we can't go there anymore. They are doing the work. We cannot go there anymore. Yes, we cannot. And that has shown that local knowledge matters, local connection matters, and our local partners have those resources. We have to value them when we do our budgeting. We have to trust them because we have been trusting them now out of necessity. We don't want, I hope that post COVID, we will build on that trust and we will build on that new dependence with our local partners and actually treat them as local partners and reflect that recognition in the way we structure funding. I think that will go a long way in the journey to save reliance and a long way to making sure that our local uh, civil society in the global south are sustainable. Thank you so much, Sani. Uh, and now we are at 1028. I want to reserve a, a minute for uh, Miriam Afrasiabi to, to wrap up. But, but before I do that, I just want to thank our panelists, Monet Arisia, Sani, Charles, for your insights, for your reflections and recommendations. And also thank the audience for posing excellent questions. I will now turn the mic back to Miriam Afrasiabi for some final words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Good afternoon. I'm Miriam Afrasiabi, Division Chief, Team Lead of the formerly named Civil Society and Media Division and our newly titled Civic Power and Citizen Engagement Team at USAID's Democracy, Human Rights and Governance Center. What I heard consistently across today's convening is that the resiliency of civil society cannot be overlooked. And even in the face of major constraints in civic space, the persistence of civic actors has stood strong. Even small wins can be monumental and impact. So I wanted just to close the event by thanking Patrick Fine and Assistant Administrator Beckering for your strong opening remarks and ongoing support to civil society and extending our deep appreciation to Lisa Peterson, Charles Van Dyke, Dr. Joseph Sani, Muna Ben Garga, and Arisia Lutsevich for your incredibly thoughtful remarks in the panel discussion. I'd also like to thank FHI 360, ICNL, and our local CSOSI partners on behalf of USAID for the tremendous work that goes into publishing each year's CSOSI reports. You have been true collaborators and partners through each and every step in the process, and CSOSI would not be where it is today without your leadership, technical expertise, and commitment to the index. And finally, a special thanks to Sam Turner, Aaron McCarthy, Kelly Burke, and all of our USAID colleagues who have supported the CSOSI over the years and helped to review and clear only 74 country reports and five regional reports. And Michael Cott, Eka, um, Emer Lishvili, Alex Najadian, and Jennifer Stewart from FHI and ICNL for your significant contributions throughout the year. We look forward to continuing to build on these discussions moving ahead and thank all of you for your active participation and for such an honest and robust discussion throughout this morning's sessions. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Bye everyone. Thank you.